Hi, my name is Jake. I'm the department head for concept art and illustration at CG Spectrum. Today we're going to look at creature design and I'm going to be utilizing these wacky stylized spiders and we're going to discuss the workflow from the very beginning, getting ideas, sketching out all of these various personalities. We'll look at some research and we're going to look at the the final rendering using line and color in two different softwares. So the, the main goal here is to give all of these spiders a very different personality. You know, the, the fellow on the top left, he's got this really neat lean. He's kind of, kind of curious, but afraid of something. Uh, I found that in my reference. The tall middle one, he's, he's kind of like a um, lanky, awkward teenager. The, the right fellow on on the top row it feels like he got he got dropped or he had an accident when he was younger I'm sure he's just a swell guy but he you know he's a little lopsided um, the bottom left is uh, a very shy camouflage worthy uh, critter uh, in the middle I really like the the spindly legs they're, they're kind of limp and amusing um, and he, he's pretty alien, but I, I think he retains a lot of spider qualities, uh, enough to hold it together, but I've pushed it pretty far. And the bottom right one looks pretty sleepy. Maybe some people think he is using psychedelics or something. Uh, I, I personally think he's just, he's just a little bit tired, right? So main goal, try and have six with very different, not only colors and, and shapes, but different personalities. And a lot of that really did come from from reference and recognizing what makes a spider at the same time as being free enough to explore shapes and ideas and not being too grounded to the realities of real research. And here you can see a lot of the inspiration from the the boxy shaped heads on the, the bottom left. There, there's a lot of embellishment on the the spider's fur and hair there's different like arrangements on on the legs of their their placement and how much really thick fur and wiry wiry hair they have their eye arrangements are different um, there's a couple in in the middle there that that might highlight really unique arrangements oops I'll go back um, they can have different sizes and, and different layouts depending on species. So that's something I, I definitely took advantage of. Uh, and you can see a lot of personality and uh, the outer images are jumping spiders, by the way. You can see a lot of posing and, and interest that just comes from how they stand or, or what actions they're doing. And that definitely fed into the, the sketching phase of this project. Um, you can also return back to your reference for the color later. You can see I, I used a lot of vibrant colors and a lot of striping that you can find in that, that research. And it only takes a few images to really get your imagination going. These, these different filaments and feather-like textures are extrapolated from this. But like I mentioned, you don't want to be so bogged down with all the details here of what exactly is on a spider. You just want to remember the key things you know there are hairs yes it, but it ultimately it has six legs it has pinchers on the f uh, not not pinchers sorry um, pedipalps they're called on the front they use that to navigate food into their mouth and they have a lot of eyes and with that I found that in my sketches I could actually push things pretty far and still maintain you know, a spider-like quality. As long as they they have the legs and the eyes, it seems like you go really far and people are still going to look at it. So here, the, the top right is an original old sketch and that inspired the little prompt you see. It says upright, um, big fangs and or, or pedipalps. Uh, I'm going to use fur and hair to differentiate uh, the different types or, or different ideas and Generally, a, a big head is going to make it feel curious, a little more relatable, and ultimately 
more on the cute spectrum. And I think that's going to increase the amount of personality that these, these spiders have. So it's a really great exercise to give yourself this visual prompt, because this is pretty much what you're going to get on, on a job where people are looking for a specific emotional presence or certain design elements and functions. And what you're going to have to do is take this bracket and do your exploration sheet pertaining to these points without losing them. So you're going to kind of push the boundaries and, and feel out creatively how far you can take it. But these are going to be uh, key to maintain while you explore. So you can see a wide arrangement of ideas. I, I didn't use a good handful of them. And, and sometimes it's just because they, they didn't have either the personality or, or shapes to be appealing enough to make it into the final cut which it's pretty hard to decide, to be honest. Um, here I use a lot of circles as base shapes sometimes to push me into getting new forms, and I even used one on the ground to give me a rough perspective. Uh, some of the other shapes are, are much more square and uh, triangular, and, and sometimes just starting with those basic shapes will really give you um, a broader range as you sketch. So when, when your roughs are done, what I would do is actually turn down the rough layer. So I'm lowering the opacity on it. And on top, I would do what is called a, a cleanup sketch, where you want to do your final line work. So the first step is just rough ideas. You don't really care as much about the, the quality of the drawing. And the second pass here, now that I've turned off the rough underdrawing, you can really see the line quality increase and I'm relying that a lot or uh, relying on that sorry a lot for the final rendering and the, the one on the the middle that's staring right at you like I, I really like that guy but he, ultimately he he's really funny but he just didn't have uh, he he pushed it a little bit too far I think for her for this project um, he still kind of cracks me up. He looks like an absolute doofus. I think he's pretty funny. Um, but like I said, the selection process is the hardest. Finding a group that are succinct together and complement each other. Uh, the one in the middle there, I, I almost used him, but he he didn't have enough personality. I think he wasn't facing the camera. He's got this slick back hair and really aerodynamic, fast-looking style. Doesn't quite do it. These big fangs are pretty funny. I almost picked this guy, but once again, uh, he's losing a lot of the spider essentials. The eyes are downplayed. The legs are hard to see. Um, I've added extra limbs uh, around those two big pedipalps, and it's kind of getting a little confusing, a little too, too alien. So hopefully this is giving you a little bit of a background into the, the struggle that is every new design that you do. It, as long as you're breaking into new ground, it's probably going to be a little bit challenging. And, and the one on the bottom, uh, right in the middle there, I, I, I really like how far that one pushed it on an abstract level. And he still holds up enough spider. Uh, the, this is where I've done a, a fill in the background. And it, it's pretty crucial for this next step, because having this mask that you can utilize for the rest of the project is very strong in in terms of process but also you can see how well the silhouette holds up you know when we zoom out which ones retain the most interest and uh, in the beginning I talked about diversity I want them all to be very stand apart from each other so it's a great way to test it so my test file I've pulled two out as an example on how I make these masks. So I've got lines on a layer above. And what I try and do is I try and get really far with the magnetic lasso. And it's, it's just the third lasso in this little column. And uh, off screen on the top, you know, you, you probably can't see this, but I'm adjusting the, the frequency and the contrast levels of where the tool will decide to drop a point as it attempts to stick the lasso around the line work. 
So it does take a little bit of fussing, but if you're working black and white, it can do an amazing job at saving you a lot of time. So it, I think it's really worth tinkering around with these settings until you can get it. So you'll click and you can kind of just be lazy with your mouse and kind of dance around the outline as you go. And you're gonna probably notice one or two mistakes, but it's just because the, the tool won't be perfect, but it hopefully will be worth fussing around with and, and save you some time. Because I, I don't know that many people who absolutely love doing, you know, the, the fills uh, or whatever stage you want to call it. Um, flats is another common one. So I'm just going to use Alt Backspace and I'm just going to fill that initial selection. And you can see it's not perfect. Like I'm missing the this guy's little socks and I'm missing the, the, the feathers um, around the, the outside of his head. Um, this one's going much easier. You can see it's it's able to grab those big bold shapes pretty well. Uh, it's not going to get into the negative spaces. Like we're going to have to define what are the holes in between the legs, and and do some cleanup. But I really do think it's uh, I don't know. It's a, it's a pretty crucial part of my my process now, and I, I find it a lot faster to get it down real quick. So there's probably a little bit more work to go on these, but I hope that serves as a good enough example. Um, from here, I'm actually moving on to Art Rage, which I, I really love for painting and drawing. Um, there's a lot of interface things that I, I find are really fascinating, but mostly for the color mixing here, which I'll, I'll demonstrate in a minute, I find it does a, a really good job of actually blending pigments and making the the media feel live and it has a a good range of tools for doing your actual uh, lines if you if you would prefer uh, I didn't use them in this case but it has good sets of um, of pencils and inks as well so my my color layer ultimately has uh, transparency locked and that I just painted over the Photoshop masks that I, I just showed you um, so I imported those, and I went to went to town trying to make these guys vibrant and fun. Um, hopefully, each one will have uh, some some complements within them to stand apart on their own. And as a group, I think they also kind of end up working together. They have a similar value range, similar color opacity or uh, color saturation. All right, so let's talk about these lines on top. So what I've actually done is um, I've actually lowered the opacity in the end because I, I don't want the line to um, be so strong that it overpowers some of the, the shapes. And uh, it, it's really subtle. So I'm going I'm to zoom in here, and, and you'll see what I mean. Um, so just watch the, the line work on on this fellow, maybe especially around the legs. Um, and as I play with it, you'll, you'll notice uh, some subtle changes. But what the opacity change will actually do is let the lines have color naturally from what is painted underneath without me having to go and actually, you know, hand draw these lines in the desired color. And the second thing that when I lower the opacity, like I, I was saying, it, it's going to allow the, the shapes of the art to come through and be a little more loose and playful. Like I, I don't want the lines to end up dominating too strong and be like jet black. They can actually uh, kind of darken your image and, and turn down its vibrancy. So switching back to full opacity you, you can see it's a little bit a uh, little bit more jarring on on the color front and when I turn it down uh, it, it's really subtle but I, I hope it you can you can see what I'm I'm gonna end up with so it's a little bit better they're starting to get some color a little bit softer and I, I think that just kind of fits the uh, aesthetic in this particular case 
And every, every time you try a different rendering style, you're going to uh, find new ways to combine all of these uh, ideas. And this was new for me, is, is trying to just push consideration. So right here, this is where I'm, I want to get into talking about the, the color blending. You can see a nice transition from this like violet into a red into a yellow all the way down to the tip. And I, I didn't paint that gradient in the middle. You know, all, all I did was add my yellow pigments into the purple and red is a byproduct of mixing those those colors together. And that, that is probably one of the biggest reasons I really like um, the flexibility in Art Rage is that the, the mediums feel a little more flexible and you, you get a little more color variation without having to really uh, stress over it. It's almost like an accident. Uh, though it, very intentional in this case. Once I discovered how to do this, uh, I've definitely employed it uh, many times. So uh, I painted on the wrong layer. Classic. So on the right layer, I, I'm actually using uh, the pastel to fill this in back to its normal color. And then I'm going to kind of take this bright yellow. Uh, on the top, I'm, I'm picking a, a certain quality of pastel so that I can I can press really hard or really soft and get the effect I want. So right here, I'm softly going over it, and you'll see that it's red. And the harder and harder I press, the more of that yellow pigment is being added. And if I press all the way, you know, it'll get full yellow. And I, I like to think of it as pigment because it, it it's a little bit in, in the realm of trying to emulate the um, subtractive and additive systems. Uh, definitely look that up if you're not aware of them. Um, it's that subtractive system way of thinking that allows these colors to actually blend on these edges and the hue and saturation gets varied as those colors mix. So like other, unlike other software you might get this purple as it blends up into the orange it's actually going to get more red it's not just going to go gray or slowly creep into orange it's it's going to change into a different hue uh, maybe in the future i can break down a little bit more how i i use art rage for various projects but i i love how the these reflections come along so naturally it makes it feel like the medium is still there but if you want to tackle this in photoshop Obviously, it's just a matter of preference, and any software will really do the trick at the end of the day. So I hope that, as a whole, this tutorial has helped somewhere along the way. Maybe you can use this process in your early researching and your exploration, all while trying to keep to some kind of design brief. It's good practice professionally, and it's a great way to give yourself uh, something solid to work on and stay focused. So thanks very much for watching.